Hello, students. I'm excited to go through the lecture for John 9, which is Jesus Heals the Blind Man. And I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction to this lecture. But before I do that, I want to join, uh, ask you to join me in a moment of prayer. So I'm going to pray for us. Lord, I just pray that you would help this uh, lecture to go well. I pray that you would guide us through it. I pray like you had restored the sight of the blind man, or rather not restored, but enabled the sight of the blind man that you would do the same for us, that you'd help us to see clearly, that you'd help us to see this lesson in John 9 clearly, and that you'd help us to see who you are clearly, Lord, and help us to see who we ought to be in relationship to you, Lord. I pray that you'd uh, bless me, help me to be accurate with what I'm sharing, and guide me by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you'd open up the minds of the students to learn by the power again of your Holy Spirit, that you'd be their teacher, Lord, that you'd be the one who would open their eyes and open all of our eyes, Lord, as we embark on this lesson. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the opportunity to study it today. Amen. So today I'm going to jump in again to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 9, Jesus Heals the Blind Man. And I'm excited to kind of walk through this with you. The question that I kind of wanted to start with before we even jump into it is whether some of these, I think in much of John's gospel, we're seeing that the story of the blind man here, uh, Jesus heals him, but it includes in this story a lot of symbolism. This requires us to kind of look at some questions, I think. I've listed them here, obviously. Uh, is this story symbolic or is it historic? Are, are these Jesus' words or are these John's words? Is this divine authorship or human authorship? And how does this all work together in the Gospel of John and throughout the Bible in many different ways? Um, the first thing I kind of wanted to do is point to the idea of plenary verbal inspiration. We've talked about this in our first lesson in hermeneutics. And this means that it's the, the idea of inspiration that's the full view of inspiration it's a concept that means that God used human authors to write scripture in a way that every word is the exact word that God intended, but at the same time, the personality and experiences of the individual authors leave their mark. And so mm -hmm. when you see a story like this of Jesus healing the blind man, you might say, is this a symbolic story or is it historically accurate? And I think the answer to that is both. I think that it's, it's a bit of a mystery of how how these things come together in God's providence. But I think that there is symbolism that Jesus appropriates. So Jesus is appropriating the symbolism of light and darkness and appropriating it for the, the analogy of um, not just physical light and darkness, but spiritual light and darkness. And so he's using sim symbolism in a historically accurate way. He actually, I believe, did this uh, miracle I believe that he actually had these exchanges, and I believe the exchanges that were recorded with the Jewish leaders between the man and his family were also historically accurate. But I think God in his providence sets up these scenarios in such a way that uh, God is using these, uh, these symbolic meanings, these symbolic things uh, to point to uh, a, a, a deeper reality. And I think the other thing that's happening here is that we're seeing the way that John tells the story. So again, it's Jesus' words that he's accurately recording. And so Jesus is the one who makes the story happen. He's the character of the story who actually provided the content. But John is choosing how to arrange the story, where to place the story to some extent. Now, some of it Jesus is choosing because Jesus is doing these things in a certain order. And in some cases, John's using the chronological order here. But where the authors put things together different ways or categorize things different ways or tell the story from a certain perspective, there's certainly a fingerprint of the author's uh, interpretation of the author's communication of the story. At the same time, they're the words that the Holy Spirit uh, meant exactly to 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 come together so in other words the holy spirit is guiding the author in as we see in scripture and the inspiration doesn't come from man but from god 
but God's giving the inspiration to man in such a way that we can still see the fingerprints of the human author and God's using those experiences of the human author to, to tell the story. So I think when we see the symbolism in this, we can, we can both understand that the story has many elements of symbolism, but that doesn't contradict the historicity of it, that it's historically accurate. The setting of this is uh, a little bit unknown. What I can tell you and what you see in Cook's commentary is that we don't know if this happened immediately after the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, as it's also called, or right before the Feast of the Dedication or any time in between. But what does seem to be obvious is that John placed the story right after the Feast of Tabernacles and the the uh, discourse where Jesus gives the I am statement, I am the light of the world. And so I think this is a continuation of the appropriation of light imagery by Jesus. And again, as I mentioned by the, the author, John, uh, to tell the story of Jesus being the light of the world and to make that clear. We've saw that at the Feast of Booths uh, with the lighting ceremony. We saw that at the Feast of Booths with the uh, discourse where we hear this I am statement, and now we're seeing it continued with this story of the healing of the blind man. And this is from a previous lecture, but when we looked at that story from the Feast of Tabernacles and the lighting ceremony, we saw the book's commentary was suggesting that Jesus was appropriating um, multiple facets of, of this um, imagery of, of light. So we see that there's many different elements of it in the Old Testament, that God created light. It was the first thing he created, uh, that he was, uh, his presence was symbolized by the pillar of light. Light's a symbol of salvation. Uh, light was symbolic for God's word. We see the use of the imagery of light in the prologue when it says that in Jesus was life and the life was the light of men. I'm sorry, light and light was the life of men. And we see the appropriation of the lighting ceremony in the Feast of Booths. So I've touched on this in a previous lecture, so I'm not going to go back into it very deeply. But you can see here that we're, we're on this continued appropriation of the symbolism of light from the Old Testament imagery from John's prologue in the Feast of Booths. There's also a symbolism uh, in the the story with the pool of uh, Siloam. The pool of Siloam was the pool from which the water was drawn for the festival um, uh, of booths, for the Feast of the Booths and Tabernacles. So when, if you recall uh, from the water portion, the water was drawn from that and the priest would raise up the water and there would be uh, sayings that would be thankful, thanking God for his provident, uh, for his provision of water uh, and here what we're seeing is that same pool is where the uh, the man has to wash, the, the blind man has to wash his eyes to receive the full impact of the miracle. But uh, as Cook points out, the word silo siloam means scent, and there's kind of a threefold imagery of scent here, or, or not imagery, but idea of scent, which is that the pool means sent and that Jesus sent him and that Jesus was the one who was sent by God. So we see a lot of symbolism in this story that's appropriate or required to understand it. I want to read the story and then we'll kind of get into it a little bit more. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not this man who sinned or his parents, but the works of God but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So Jesus is making it really clear here in contrast to uh, chapter five, where we saw the paralytic and they said that indicated that it was likely the man's sin that caused him to go paralyzed. In this case, this man was born blind. And at this time they believed that it would be potentially a person's sin, or even if they were born blind, it could be that their parents had sinned. And in this case, Jesus is saying it's not anybody's sin that caused this, but this was actually done to glorify God. It was done so that I might be able to show a great work in him. And so we have to be careful in um, trying to interpret reasons for certain things like sickness. Um, and I think this lesson demonstrates that. 
We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus sees both his impending death here, I think, and then also that there's just an, an eschatology that it, eventually the time for salvation will end. And so as long as work is to be done, Jesus is going to do the work. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. He then anointed the man's eyes with the mud and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. So this is obviously very odd. We've seen this in some of the synoptic gospels. We see some similar odd means of, of, of doing a miracle. God, obviously, Jesus could have just spoken. The man would have been well, but for some reason he chose to do this, I think probably to... Um, again, uh, draw the point of the pool of Siloam, perhaps. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said it isn't. It is him. Another said, no, it, but it is somebody that looks like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to, to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. So people were disputing whether or not this was the same guy. They were surprised to see him able to see since he had been blind from birth. And so the neighbors were questioning him. Then they brought him to the Pharisees, the man. Then they brought to the Pharisees, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. Again, possibly uh, drawing some contention about Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I wash and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was division among them. So again, they said to the blind man, what do you say about him? Since he has opened your eyes, he said, he is a prophet. So we're going to see a, progress, a progressive realization of who Jesus is by this man throughout the story. And we see we see that other places in the in the book of John. We saw that with the woman at the well, where she started using stronger language to describe who Jesus is. So he called him a man, and now he's calling him a prophet. The Jews did not believe. So the, the Pharisees now are questioning this man. It's the first time they question him. And he gives a very simple answer. And then they ask him, um, some are debating whether he's a, a person from God or whether he's potentially doing evil work. And, and they're disputing that. Uh, the argument for evil work is that he's healing on the Sabbath. The argument that he's from God is that the works that he's doing must only be able to become from God. Uh, but the man here says he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and then asked them, is, your son, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. So they're asking his parents, is this really your son? People are, some are saying it's the same guy. Some are saying it's not. And they're saying, yeah, this is our son, but we don't know how he's able to see. Cook points out that the parents are distancing himself, themselves from the son. They're not showing the courage that the son ultimately shows in this story. Uh, but also they haven't seen the revelation of Christ like the son has seen. And the, in the Gospel of John, there's a note that says here, within the context, it says his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. So to be put out of the synagogue, to be basically excommunicated, to be basically damned, these people had one means for um, coming to God, and that was through the sacrificial system, and if they would be put out of the synagogue, they would be helpless. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who'd been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that a man, that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, I now see. That reminds me, that line just reminds me of the hymn, um, that that's uh, I'm trying to think of exact term, words of it, but um, I'll have to I'll have to come back to it. I'm sorry. They said to him, "But I can now see." They said to him, "What did he do to you? He did he? How did he open your eyes?" He answered them, "I have told you already, 
and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. So here we see, again, the, the Jewish leadership trying to kind of create a juxtaposition between Moses and Jesus. You're either with Jesus or you're with Moses, which is ironically very incorrect. It's it's that if you knew, the, if you observed the, the teachings of Moses, you would know Jesus. You would know the one who sent Moses is the one who sent me. Um, but he's saying here, well, we're with you're either with Moses or you're with this man. And he's saying, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. I think another interesting observation is in a previous chapter, one of the accusations of one of the reasons for saying that Jesus wasn't from wasn't the Messiah was because they knew where he come from, where he came from. Now their reason for denying Jesus is that they don't know where he came from. So it seems that the Jewish leaders are content on rejecting Jesus regardless of what the reasons. And if, in fact, if the reasons contradict each other, that doesn't doesn't seem to be a problem. The, the main problem in their position here seems to be growing, that they just are, have a lot of animosity towards Jesus and they have to get rid of him. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but in, if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us as they cast him out? So this man had courage. Though he was a beggar, though he was a blind person that was desperate, that was hopeless, that was probably just basically marginalized, he turns around and he starts teaching them with wisdom, saying, hey, look, if, if he's been able to do all these things, he has to be from God. And now they're saying, who are you to teach us? And they turn and say, what we know not to be true, they say you were born in sin. In a sense, that's all true for all of us. But in, in the way they meant it, that there was some sin of his parents that caused him to be blind, or he was um, sinful even in his mother's womb or something of that nature. Jesus heard they had cast him out and having found himself, they said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. So here we see Jesus admitting to this man and, and revealing to this man that he is the son of man. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. So now we again see the progression from prophet to a man of God to the son of man to Lord and one worthy of worship. Jesus said, for judgment came into this world that those who do not, do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to them, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you'd have no guilt. But now you say we see our, now that you say we see, your guilt remains. So I just wanted to conclude this with a few observations. This man was, you know, in physical and spiritual darkness. Blindness in the Old Testament was a metaphor for spiritual darkness. John's point here is to contrast the difference and you see this in Cook's commentary, is to contrast the different the different effect of Jesus, the light of the world, on the blind man and the Pharisees. And Cook points out that the blind man receives physical and spiritual sight from Jesus. He makes three confessions of ignorance, but in the end, he receives true vision and faith, where Jesus brings spiritual light to those who are spiritually blind. The Pharisees, on the other hand, can see physically, but they, not bling, but they are spiritually blind. And they make several assertions of how knowledgeable they are, but in the end, they're shown to be ignorant. And Jesus passes judgment on those who see themselves as having no spiritual need. There's a, three rounds of interrogations here. The, the Pharisees interrogate the man, then they interrogate his parents, and then they interrogate the man again, intensifying the uh, interrogation. And, and at this point, in the first point, they're trying to understand, are you the man? Are you, Oops, I'm sorry. Um what I just did. They're trying to ask him, are you the man that we thought was blind? Yes. Were you healed? How were you healed? Then they interrogate the parents. Is this in fact the son? Uh, and then they turn around and interrogate the man again. Now they're no longer questioning the validity of the miracle, but they're trying to find a way to get evidence to trap Jesus. 
And sadly, um, what happens here is this man is immediately moved from physical darkness to light, uh, while on the flip side, the Pharisees, though they believe they're in the light, are found to be in darkness. What we see, though, is that this man is immediately moved from physical darkness to light, but we see a progressive movement of spiritual darkness into spiritual light. And Cook, this, uh, Cook kind of points out that there's some time, some element of progressively re understanding who Jesus is. Progressively, Jesus progressively reveals himself and the man progressively understands. So that can be a, a thing that I think God can actually bring us spiritually from darkness to light instantaneously. But I think many times it can be more of a progressive revelation. And here we're probably talking about progressive over a matter of minutes or hours or, or days, but nonetheless still progressive. And, um, you know, so it's an interesting concept to consider. And then I think one other point that uh, scholars often make here or teachers often make is that there's a contrast between the man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda in chapter five and this man here who's healed at the pool of Siloam in chapter nine. Uh, one man, when he had pressure put on him from the Jewish leaders, he kind of threw Jesus under the bus. He didn't make any revelations of who Jesus was. He didn't. They didn't demonstrate any way that he had come to faith spiritually. He was physically healed, but we don't really see any anything definitive that he he received spiritual healing. We you know we don't know for sure that he didn't, but there is some reasons to suspect that probably he didn't. Where here, when we see this blind person healed, we see not only is he spiritually healed or physically healed, but he's also spiritually healed because we can see that he he explicitly um, claims that he believes in God, that he believes that Jesus is the Son of Man. And he calls him Lord and, and worships him. So that's our prayer for you guys that, that we'll all, for all of us, that we'll see God for who he is and that we'll worship him rightly in light of that, in light of that vision. God bless you.